All right, welcome back to our course, The Contingency Clause and the Client's Best Protection. Once again, this course came out of a live situation where I believe the properly drafted contingency clause might have saved a bunch of hassle. Um, I submitted this to the state. state approved it. So obviously they must believe that this contingency clause is an important factor too. Now what we've touched on up to now is what a contingency is and what a clause is and how it kind of works. So right now what I want to talk about is how to write a great contingency clause for your client. Because a properly drafted contingency clause is a sweet thing to have. If you mess up and you don't completely, and I keep saying a well-drafted contingency clause, sound like uh, some well-drafted contingency clause. <laughs> yeah, I know. Okay, so they, hey, they all, all the jokes can't be winners because um, there are poorly drafted contingency clauses, and what I'd like to eliminate is any poorly drafted contingency clauses. And, you know, I'm kind of on the fence. Is a bad contingency clause better than no contingency clause? I don't know. So ultimately, the answer would be just, hey, write a great one. Then you don't have to worry about it. Any questions? All right. Question was, at what point do we consider writing uh, contracts? You know, this is a question that I've always asked myself about how much can we actually write in that further conditions without it actually being a contract and us practicing law. So at this point, I'm going to not answer that question and assume that if you write a couple sentences, uh, a contingency clause here or there, that you are not in fact drafting a legal document, uh, I would assume, well, I won't assume, I, I will know, that if you try and write a lease or a land contract in its entirety, they would consider that practicing law. All right? <clears throat> Got a bug in my throat. Hold on. So, by writing something in the further conditions, and we're limited to space, I would say as long as you stay in that five or six or seven lines of space and only write one or two, we're not going to be hit with practicing uh, for law, all right? So let's talk about great contingency clause. A minute ago, I told you there are three sections, and I said at least three sections. Here's what I really want you to know. There are five great contingency portions, or there are five portions to a great clause, all right? The first one that we talked about a minute ago was the action or. Who's to act? Now, most contingency clauses initially are written by the selling agent or the buyer uh, at the request of the buyer. All right? Sellers can have a contingency clause in there, too. Uh, we use the home sale contingency clause. You know, subject, I'm going to sell this home, subject to me buying another one. I've seen that. Uh, it's not a real good example, but... Sellers can use it. So you need to actually state in your contingency who is going to act. Now, remember, who is going to act in the real estate world is typically the buyer or the seller. Not the plumber, not the electrician. Because the buyer is going to engage the plumber. So it's still the buyer has to act. So, you know, you, know, you may put contingent upon the buyer hiring a, an electrician to certify... Uh, the fuse panel box within the next 48 hours after acceptance of the purchase agreement. So you label in there, who is to act? It's the buyer to engage a plumber or the buyer to hire a plumber or whatever. So it's still actually the buyer's acting. You don't want to say subject to plumber approving because how's a plumber going to approve that? Somebody's got to hire the plumber a random plumber is just not going to walk in out of, hey, let me do your house. So who is to act is typically the buyer. And you should say the buyer to hire a plumber or hire a licensed plumber or to engage or something like that. Then you need to actually state what activity is going to be done. 
all right? In the example there, I got the buyer may inspect the property and all the elements thereof using inspectors of the buyer's choosing, all right? So there we've talked about, that's just set one section of the uh, contingency clause, by the way. So we have actually outlined the contingency. Inspect the property and subject and all elements thereof with a buyer's choosing. The question will, then you have that timeline of what is to be satisfied. How do we clear, finger quotes for those of you at home, or the word satisfied, a contingency? The buyer shall have 10 business days after the date the buyer and seller have signed this agreement to give written approval of the inspection. All right. So there, that's actually a positive one, by the way. Um, it says 10 business days. All right. Now, that's pretty well thought out if you think about it, because that doesn't say 10 days or 10 calendar days. That says 10 business days. Right. You see what I'm saying? That doesn't count. Saturday and Sunday, all right? You could even write 10 banking days, 10 calendar days, whatever. Yeah, uh, the question was, if you write 10 days, is it assumed to be calendar? I would say that most judges would say that was your intent. If you wrote 10 days and didn't distinguish banking, business, you know, whatever, uh, that uh, a, a judge would rule that your probably intent was 10 calendar days. Now, if you wanted to be specific and ultimately sure, you could write 10 calendar days, all right? But the point being is, it tells you when that contingency is satisfied, all right? Now, it also tells you how the contingency is satisfied. Now, or waived, and we haven't got into how you waive a contingency, so, <clears throat> Let's hold that for a second, right? Waive a contingency. I don't want to get into it. I'll, I'll, trust me. If I don't remind you, uh, if I don't talk about it, remind me, but I know because I know what's in here. All right? So we're going to talk about what waiving a contingency is. So how is it satisfied? Unless the buyer gives written approval of the inspection. That's how it's going to be satisfied. Once we give that written approval, that contingency has been satisfied and or what they use the word cleared. So that inspection has been, that contingency has been cleared. All right. Now we use contingencies in the commercial world, like subject to a clean environmental report. When that environmental report comes back, we would satisfy that contingency by sending something over to the seller and say, hey, we've got the report, we agree with it, and we are re uh, releasing or satisfying that contingency. So once you satisfy it now, remember, it becomes part of the contract. If you fail to satisfy it, then that is your out. This is a positive one, see? Positive meaning it requires us to act. It, we must give written approval of the inspection. If we fail to give written approval within the 10 business days, well, we haven't, uh, it's considered to have been disapproved the inspection. That's the positive side, even though it says, because it's positive for us. And we'll talk about that, okay? What if the contingency is not satisfied? Satisfied. Here we go. See, I told you. If a if the what happens if the contingency is not clear? If the buyer disapproves the property, the transaction's void, and all earnest money deposited shall be returned because it is a contingency that we can't meet. We are not approving the inspection. So, you, you is it confusing? Have I confused you? <clears throat> if it's not approved, it's assumed disapproved, therefore the contract can be terminated because we can't close that contract because part of the contract that became part of the contract when he, the buyer and seller agreed was that I would give a 10 day or a written approval of the inspection response. If I don't, it's assumed to be disapproved. I didn't give the written approval, it's assumed to be disapproved, therefore we didn't 
can't close the inspection and I'm not liable for a, a breach of contract because it was a contingency we put in. All right. Make sure that you have a, the contingency clause, what happens if it's not satisfied. Um, there are some common things to uh, consider. Here's a couple examples. A transaction becomes invalid. If the condition qualified by the contingency is not met by the date certain, the transaction is canceled. For example, if the gifted funds are not received by October 22nd, the transaction is void. So if your buyer is looking to get the down payment gifted to him by his rich aunt grandma who's gallivanting all over the world and said she'd be home uh, and give you some money on the 20th of October, but you're not sure if she's going to be, so you write a contingency that says, as long as I get my money gifted to me by the 22nd, I'm willing to move forward. If I don't get my money by the 22nd, then this transaction is void. That's an excellent contingency as far as how it protects your client. Because if you didn't write that in there, let's say, and now they go to closing and they want him to bring his 20 grand, he's like, oh, I don't have 20 grand because my grandma didn't give it to me. She's not back from her world tour. I could be in trouble as the buyer and be subject to breach of contract. But with this clause in here that says if I don't get it by the 22nd, then the transaction becomes void. Question? Well, no, no. Uh, the question was the, the, about gifted funds. Um, no, it, uh, this is just an example. I mean, you can use other things in there. If the inspection response is, is subject to more than $400 worth of repair, the transaction becomes void. That's one of my favorite ones, all right? If the home repairs from the home inspection are more than a certain amount of dollars to repair, I write a contingency that says then the transaction is void because I don't want to buy a house that has $20,000 to repair or whatever, okay? There's also this thing called a self-remove, all right? If the benefiting party does not disapprove the contingency within a time period, the contingency is self-removed. If buyer does not object within 10 business days, buyer has been uh, deemed to have approved the condition. This is the, the clause that we have currently in our inspection response, right? You guys know this. If the buyer makes an, in, uh, an inspection response, and the seller refuses or fails to respond in a certain amount of time, he is deemed to have accepted what the buyer sent him. That is called self-removing. Because he failed to act within a timeline, it goes against him. So <clears throat> you need to talk about what happens if the contingency clause is uh, excused or satisfied. Now, there's this term called silence by the party. Silence by the parties uh, claims the benefit of the contingency is one in whether the silence is treated as approval or disapproval. All right? So what I just said, silence by the party. The seller, if he does not respond, meaning he's silent, then in, it benefits the buyer because he's assumed to have approved what the buyer sent him in the inspection response. So here's a couple, two different ones. Look at this. If the buyer does not issue a written disapproval of the property inspection report within seven business days, the buyer is waiving this contingency and accepting the condition of the clause. It self-removes, meaning there does not have to be anything done to remove it. It removes itself by him not writing the disapproval. If the buyer does not give written approval to the property inspection report within self-business days, it is void without further action. Once again, self-removing. Because if he doesn't give the approval and stays silent on that eighth business day, the transaction's void. Okay? So those are called self-removing or, or silence by the parties. And you typically, those are great things to put in your contingency to make sure the party has to answer 
and if they fail to answer, something happens, okay? Now, I know that was a lot. If you've got any questions, uh, let me know, because we're going to talk about another topic here in just a second called ripening of a clause, all right? So, uh, all those five things, who acts, when they act, what's the clause they have to act, what happens if they don't remove it, uh, is it a positive or negative, depending on the silence of the parties, all right? Any questions? Once again, at home, if you've got questions, call, uh, email me, Raymond at realuniversity.com is the best way. So uh, let's move on to the next one.